Tend to record. Oh boy, you're good. All right, thank you, Cheryl. Okay. Um, this is a kind of quantum quantum image here. Uh, if people are listening to this uh, well, later on YouTube. We've got a uh, couple of images side by side on uh, on the left side of the screen is uh, an image from the uh, Hubble telescope of what's known as the Hourglass Nebula. And uh, it's, so I don't know how many light years away, the Hubble picked it up. Uh, so that's a picture on the left and it's just, there's a kind of eye in the middle of it. And then there's rings of energy. There's three above and three below. It's amazing uh, when you look at the picture on the right, which is a, a kind of a picture of what the Hindus uh, came up with about 4,000 years ago as they studied the body. Uh, and they were, it's the oldest probably uh, of the great religions. Um, and uh, they were looking for the connection between human beings and the cosmos and the divine. And uh, so what you're looking at on the right uh, is the, the chakra system. The chakras are meant a wheel of light or wheels of energy. And you can see that in, in, both, in both, both pictures. There's just uh, uh, light is energy. I mean, you know, and then you bring it all the way up to Einstein and those guys in the early 20th century and they realized it's all energy. It can be, it can be uh, in the form of matter or in the, in the form of light. Uh, it moves around, but so it's quite amazing that they saw this. And if you if you look at the uh, chakra system from the bottom to the top, you got you know good old Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Uh, it's very interesting when you see a uh, uh, a rainbow up in the up in the sky in the cosmos. It follows this progression. So there's there's something going on here that we want to we want to look into this connection between uh, uh, the human energy system and the cosmic energy system and um, the more people study especially uh, quantum physics the more they understand that um, yeah, it, it's like the whole cosmos is in us in every cell. Uh, we're mirroring this this energy system, and uh, so uh, I want to you know the modern day Hubble telescope four thousand years ago the Hindus discovered this, uh, and uh, I want to uh, start out talking about then then go somewhere in between. Let's go to the Middle Ages, the twelfth century, and we'll talk about the three eyes. It looks like there's seven, but really uh, you can boil it down to three. Uh, Richard of uh, St. Victor, uh, who was in the monastery of Saint Victoire outside of Paris, uh, 12th century, uh, he wrote about the three eyes, the three centers of awareness. Uh, and, and talked about how they were different. And for Richard, he talked to you, the first one was the body, the eye of the body, the eye of flesh. And those bottom three chakras, the red and the orange and the yellow, those centers of energy are called by Hindus and chakra folks, those are the body centers. Those are the body centers. Uh, and then the top three, the blue, the indigo, and the violet are called the mind centers. And then right in the middle, connecting the two, connecting body and mind is the heart center. And the heart center is green for many reasons. It's, it's, it's what brings everything to life. Uh, and uh, so Richard St. Victor saw these three uh, uh, centers of awareness uh, the body center, which is uh, sensate, uh, it connects through the, sen uh, through the senses, 
and actually connects to our right brain. Uh, and then the uh, mind center, which is contiguous with the left brain. Uh, and that, those are connected, of course, if you know brain uh, psychology or brain physiology, connected by all these axonal fibers, it connects the left brain and the right brain, but they have very different functions, very different functions. And then there's uh, what uh, Richard called the, the connecting one, the integrating uh, source of awareness would be the heart. And that's the center uh, or it's center where the green is. And if you can get, it can connect and integrate body and mind. Uh, uh, I'm gonna take the screensaver off now, but that image should be in your brain. Uh, you know, we're, 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 we're in a, a culture that splits body and mind. They don't seem to be connected. Uh, I wrote a poem one time uh, about what it was like to go through the educational system and they train you to be a head on a stick. You don't need a body to graduate from Notre Dame or some other place and to learn a bunch of stuff. And you know, PE, lower level, it, this idea of the body and mind that is a split is endemic in Western culture. It's a pandemic in Western culture. And uh, you can go through and be quite successful in our culture just by being a head on a stick. You don't need any bodily awareness whatsoever. And I lost most of that during my training. And um, it was only through uh, meditation uh, and uh, the visceral aspect of meditation, which I learned from the Zen guys and then eventually the Tibetans, uh, to, to a way to bring the body and mind together online. And uh, the Christian contemplatives and the Tibetans in Buddhism, they end up talking about the heart, that the heart is going to be the connector to integrate this whole, uh, your whole view of life. We have sort of a fragmented view of life growing up in the West and, you know, not just in the West, as the uh, Asian countries are mimicking our culture, you know. So, uh, so those are the three uh, eyes from Richard of St. Victor. He was, he was pretty, uh, he had a teacher who taught it to him, Hugh, uh, Brother Hugh of St. Victor. But uh, really, he became famous for those. And uh, so that was sort of the eye of the senses, the sensate body, the eye of the of mind, words, thoughts, logic, etc. And then the, the eye of the heart, which is also known as the eye of contemplation from the Middle Ages. Uh, the contemplation was about the heart. So uh, from there, uh, it's very interesting, and this is just my own take on it, just as I've done this work for 50 years, I've, I've realized that we come, this is it's just the magnificent uh, just spirit of the, of the cosmos that we come, when we come out of our mother's womb, we come equipped with three operating systems. I want to use the sort of computer uh, terminology here, because most of us have cell phones, most of us have computers, and then every once in a while you get this notice from, you know, your uh, whatever kind of phone or computer you have that it's time to update your operating system. And uh, after a while, if you don't update it it, it, it actually ceases to function or doesn't function very well. So the fact is, every every one of us coming out of the womb we had these three operating systems loaded into our wetware. And, uh, and I want to sort of roll through them and give you a view of what the potential is. And uh, what is the potential harm of uh, not uh, of getting stuck uh, any one place. And I mean, you know, this, this will explain why you know, we're going about destroying the planet as we speak. And so many people in the process. It's, it's a matter of our way of seeing reality. I mean, your, your operating system is like a pair of glasses. Uh, 
and it's experiential. It's how you experience the world, depending on what operating system you're operating from. I, I'll, this is just something I'll never forget. I was 16. Uh, <clears throat> basketball was my God. I had not yet Pam, met Pam in high school, but I was 16 playing basketball. And, uh, and then uh, I went for an eye test and they realized I was nearsighted. And so they, they gave me these awful looking athletic glasses. They look like, I look like a bug, but had a little strap on them. But I'll never remember the first time I, I walked on the court with my glasses on. Uh, I looked, I was about half court when I looked up and I saw the rim for the first time. And I said, holy shit. And then I, I took off my glasses and there was this orange color patch. And then I put my glasses back on and there was the rim. Different pair of glasses. And needless to say, my free throw percentage went up about 20 percent just because i could see the damn rim even you know even from the foul line i was shooting at sort of a an orange color patch and uh, then when i put them on i could see the rim you know it was, it was amazing and it's like that when you get an upgrade of your operating system all of a sudden you see things you didn't see and you see in a different way the world is different you see um there's there's so many uh uh so many parables in in the, in the stories of Jesus of, of, about people who gain, who gain their sight, and there are parables, they're metaphors. He often says to the to the, his disciples, he speaking metaphorically. We've destroyed the Jesus wisdom because we make it literally. He says, "Do you have eyes and you can't see? Do you have ears and you can't hear?" He's always talking about blindness and deafness, but he's talking about because he's coming from a very different operating system. He's trying to nudge them forward. You know, Jesus was working with the uh, the ultimate operating system as most mystics operate with. And uh, you know, you, you got to, you know, this was a journey. These guys were just uh, fishermen. You know, they were just, you know, normal guys. Uh, and uh, to be able to upgrade your operating system to be on to where you could see a Jesus, it took a lot. Even even being with Jesus for a couple of years probably didn't do it. It took some time. It took Pentecost. It took a lot of other things. It took the resurrection. And they still didn't see it. It was a growth thing. And so we're working on this. So let's look, let's, let's consider first the first operating system that we all, uh, you know, we all get. And I call that the childhood operating system. Uh, Thomas uh, Keating calls it the emotion, uh, emotional operating system, because we really don't have words. We don't have uh, higher logic or anything. We're coming out. But uh, so the, the childhood operating system, you, you, if you see the Enneagram, it's laid out there. It's laid out there. And in Buddhism, they follow these three things. They talk about the three uh, uh, temptations. Jesus meets these three temptations in the desert. It's, it's all a metaphor and it's all mirrored in all the traditions. The first, the first thing that is in our operating system that clicks on is we're laying there. We can't even turn over. We're breathing air, light. You know, we came from darkness. Now we're in light. This is all quite uh, you know, symbolic. And then all of a sudden, you know, we can't really do anything, can't turn over, can't speak. And uh, so we got all this light, we're breathing air for the first time, and all these huge beings are running around. We don't know, they're all concerned about us, but we think like, this is really scary. And so a lot of emotions start to get packed in there, this feeling of helplessness, this feeling of being overwhelmed, <laughs> this feeling of Hey, well, why did mom kick me out? These are all, you know, the, the operating system is trying to deal with all this. But we're basically a sensate operating system at that point. That's that first eye that Richard was talking about. We come out with the eye of body. And the sensate operating system is interested in um, survival and security, first of all. Okay. And that's that five, six, seven part of the Enneagram. Uh, those are the concerns there, survival and security. That's the first thing. Maybe, you know, you don't even know where your source of food is at that point. You still, you still are, don't even know there's a difference between you and mom. It's, it's, it's pretty wild. Uh, 
we repress and all this, but you know, you know, but it's in there. This idea that's real, and thank God, you know, because the first thing is if you don't survive, the ball game's ball game's over for this incarnation. So that's very strong. This idea of survival and security, and people at the five, six, and seven on the enneagram, they feel this is the first thing: safety, survival, security. All right. And then, you know, it, it sort of rolls out a little bit more and starts to release a little bit more. And then the, the, uh, our, our, the little child says, you know, that, there's the food. They, you know, get put to the mother's breast. And so they start putting two and two together and says, oh, all right, that's where I can, I can survive. And maybe, I, you know, if I could make that woman like me, uh, she'll feed me. And, you know, the big guys, brothers, you know, some of us were born into, you know, I had two older sisters, some people, some women are born and they got five older brothers. It's wild, you know, but it's like, well, gee, if, if these guys like me, maybe I'll survive. So then you, you pull on that. Mommy, they like me. Brilliant. That is brilliant. You know, that's, this is a great operating system. So, all right. People like me enough to feed me, and uh, maybe things are rough around the edges, but at least I'm you know, growing, growing, growing. And then, uh, then you go up, you know, maybe in a couple of years, maybe you've got a few da-da, and maybe you can see things, but you really you don't have language or, or much thought. But, but by the time you're, you know, around one and a half, two, then you, um, you go up to the top of the Enneagram, eight, nines, and ones, and now, now you, you know, Power and control become, you know, that's why they, we call it the terrible twos, because now there's this little power struggle. It doesn't end if you, especially if you have young children or have had children, you know, this goes on for a while, this power and control uh, between, uh, between parent and child. But this is where, you know, me do it. I don't want you to feed me, me do it, me do it. And uh, so that is the sort of survival and security, affection and esteem, power and control. We have it all wired into us, depending on where you're on the Enneagram, uh, you know, it has more emphasis or less emphasis. And then, a, you know, depend on the family you're living in. You know, all sorts of variations happen beyond that. But that's the basic childhood operating system. It's a, a sensate operating system, which is a binary op operating system because you can go down to a single celled organism. They're going to go towards pleasure and go away from pain. So that's the binary nature of that childhood operating system. And we still, all of us still have it uh, in us. Uh, the question is whether it's it's operating and whether you've upgraded functional or not, you know, or whether it's still dysfunctional. Because if your whole life is is depending on like a child has to be, you want to go towards pleasure and new nurturance and you know food. Towards pleasure, go away from pain, and that's. That's what we need to survive. And we carry that into, and you know, about time you're four or five or six, and you sort of figured out the family, you figured out how to stay away from the painful people and then go towards the people who like you, you know, then all of a sudden they throw you into school where there's a bunch of kids who have all kinds of different experiences that, you know, a teacher who's not your mother at all, you know, and it's, it's, it's wild, you know, so you're, you're trying to go through, you know, all right, I passed this test, okay. You try to still go through pleasure and go away from pain. You know, we have favorite subjects, you know, all that stuff happens. And it's really meant to carry you. Now you're starting to actually starting to lean into the uh, second operating system, which Now we have language and speech and you go into kindergarten, you're learning your ABCs and whatever, knowledge is, starts to come in. Your that other thing is still running, but uh, you're, you're, you're starting to be introduced to the adult operating language of speech, of knowledge. And now time and space start to come up. You're in school, the clock is on the wall. You know, when you're before you're in school, 
there's no time. You know, there's no time on the wall. There's time, there's space, sit in your desk. You know, I had 60 people in my first grade. I've got the picture of it. We're all there sitting in our desk, you know. We had some fierce nuns, and you'd had to be fierce if you had these 60 little beings there who all wanted pleasure and didn't want pain. You know? <laughs> so it's wild. So time and space comes into it. Uh, and then uh, management. Of, of time and space, management, you know, getting your homework done on time. We go into a totally different world, okay? The first world, when it's, that's why we look back on childhood in some ways as a golden time, because it was all about me, 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 me. That, that's all that, that's all that operating system is meant to do. It's focused on me, 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 me. And now there's other people around. And actually, uh, in in the uh, uh, in the indigenous cultures, uh, right around junior high time in our culture, but right around eleven or twelve, especially for the boys, the boys are getting bigger and they're they're actually dangerous. Me, 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 and you know they're a little more dangerous. So they would take the boys out and initiate them kill them almost, you know, bury them alive or make them do all these arduous tasks, wound them. And then they would sit down and say, okay, we got another operating system. When you go back into the village, you're not anybody's boy anymore. You're a man. And, and, and so, you know, the, the rules come down. Okay. And it's, it really works. We don't have anything quite like that. Uh, in the fifties, the bishop, hit me on the cheek. Didn't quite do it though. You know, didn't quite do it. Now it's an adult in the face, but it didn't really, not really, you see. And uh, in our culture in the West, we, in, because we don't have these clear switchovers to this uh, uh, second operating system, where all right, you're not a boy anymore, you're a man. You're not a, a girl anymore, you're a woman. Of course, for girls, it would happen with their, their first menstrual period. And the women would take them out and say, okay, you got when you go back, you know, your relationship to your mother and father and the whole tribe has changed now. You're, you're a woman now, okay? You can bear children, but more or less, you got to see things differently. So now there's an us. It's not just about me. There's an us. There's the tribe. There's your family. You're an adult. Uh, unfortunately, what comes in, even, even though... Uh, we don't really have this uh, clear right of initiation into adulthood. Still, we start to see there's other people around, there's us. And then unfortunately, then there's also a lot of them. Those who are not like us comes in and here. So again, it's a binary operating system. So binary means two. There's, there's my tribe, then there's that other tribe. And you know, that had these first two operating systems they're, they're operating uh, together, of course. I actually, all, all three need to operate together to have an integrated life. But at first, and then, you know, some of the problems that came from seeing people who don't look like me as other, you know, we're having this whole freak out about critical race theory and all that stuff. Well, it's a, it goes very deep, it goes way back to this us and them kind of view, people who don't look like, who are different. You see. Now, the third operating system, uh, which kicks in normally in the second half of life because you get another initiation, you could be rolling along with these first two operating systems, and then you know, just things don't work out. Life gives you a second initiation. You lose your job, disasters happen, uh, you, know, you get divorced, uh, people die. There's, it happens in the second uh, half of life usually, but there's, a, there's a, a next operating system to go to, which I would call the integral operating system. This is the level, the level at which uh, mystics are seeing the world. What's the difference here? Uh, integral op operating system is, is, is not based on language. It's based on silence. It's not, it's, it's not shooting for knowledge. You already have that. It's shooting for wisdom and experience. And this really gives you an idea of what you do when we're ringing the bell and all of a sudden you stop talking. At least I stopped talking. 
talking continues in here, but you know, we go into silence and then it's not about knowledge, it's about wisdom and experience. It's not about time and space, it's about now and eternity. This integral operating system, which includes the functional parts of both the childhood and the adult operating system, it includes it and then adds in the, the component that can deal with uh, things that are beyond time and space, uh, things that actually are uh, pre-time and space, because we still have a whole lot of stuff, trauma and repression in our uh, unconscious. And so the integral operating system, the, the way the mystics work with it is it includes everything that's functional, drops out the dysfunctional, drops out the me, 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 drops out even the us and them. So you go from me to we. And so that's why mystics see everybody as a we, the, you know, the, this is a mystic vision. They don't, they see differences, but they don't see separation. And that is a very different thing. Now where, uh, you know, the adult operating system is about managing time and space. Uh, the integral operating system is about relationships relating to not only each other, not only to your family and the people you work with and the people you live with in this state or county or country, but also your relationship to the planet, to the transcendent, something that's beyond time and space, whatever you want to call it. And that is the key thing here is you're not in the dual, it's non-dual. I mean, that's why I have the uh, little shrine next to me here. That's a, uh, that little uh, thing says not to, because that's the ultimate teaching here when you get into the third way of seeing it. Doesn't mean that everything is one. That's This is key, because if everything is one, then everything sort of lobs together at some kind of like um, tapioca pudding, everybody's the same. No, one, it can be a very dangerous thing. The one chosen people, you know, the one German race, you know, we've seen, you know, and all of a sudden those guys who aren't like us, they go in the ovens. One can be dangerous, uh, not two. You don't put it, nobody goes in the ovens. When you just, not two says, yeah, we're, we're all together in this. It, it can it can see difference, but not as separation. And we're dealing with that with with you know the legacy of races. People have different color skin. They're other than me. No, not from a mystic point of view. And we are not. We've got you know we're we're fighting it out. You know they said oh well there's division in this country. Well there's division in every country that's running at the highest operating system we got is just the. Uh, left brain operating system because it always sees you know one one thing is not like the other and that's important for management when you're uh, young you know to know the difference between a, a car and a you know, gun or you know a chair and a table one thing is not like the other yeah that's true but um they're not separate they're not separate see so the, you start to grasp this uh, this is why it becomes an integral way of looking at the world. And so you can see difference and vive la difference, as uh, the French say. You know, we, we say long live the difference in people, but separation goes out the window. You can't, you can't treat people. Uh, you know, some lives are not more important than other lives to a mystic. And I, you know, they just realize all life, all living beings is this family. It's a big uh, family. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I th that's, that's about our time. I wanna give you some time to go to the pad and just put down what resonates with you. But when we come back, when we come back, before we sit, uh, I'll, I'll make a look, uh, an important link to absolutely what we do when and why we're prac. What are we practicing when we shut our eyes, shut our mouths, 
and uh, open our hearts. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll be back at uh, the top of the hour. <laughs>